clap to him, Lord. Sing, Lord, you are the lion and the lamb. And we praise your name today. trailer. What's the number one most grossing movie of all time? Titanic. Titanic. Yes. If you were an entourage, which I don't endorse, it would be Aquaman. But uh, if you do watch Entourage, if you don't, okay, forget about it. But Titanic is the number one most grossing film of all time. I think, how much was it? A lot of money. <laughs> Tons of money. It's just, I mean, I know people that watch Titanic like 10 times. Like, I remember when I was, when I think I was in high school, and people were just like, cry, all these girls were crying. They go, I just saw it for 10 times. And I'm just like, I didn't see it yet. They're like, you're dumb. You should go watch it. And I'm like, why? They're like, it's so good. I go, I know the ending. <laughs> why would I want to watch a movie that I know the ending to? I know what happens to the Titanic. It sinks. Why would I want to watch a movie seven, eight times? And he goes, oh, Sam, it's not about that. It's about the romance. I'm like, I'm not going to pay $10 to watch seven times watching you know, them going like this. Let's put it up there. Going like that. I can fly, Jack. <laughs> I think this is perhaps the most It's the sappiest movie in all of history. All right, everybody sing with me. Across the distance and spaces between us. Eddie, you can't dance, man. You can't dance. All right. Let's put the sappy music behind us. Let's talk about the real issue. The Titanic. We could cut the music, you know. Everybody's gonna cry when I start preaching here. Oh, there you go. There you go. Thank you for that. Let's give let's give Titanic a hand. Let's, let's give them a hand. I mean, it's the worst movie in history. It made the most money though. But the Titanic was supposed to be a ship that was practically all the newspapers wrote that was unsinkable. And one person, actually, the captain of the ship, before it hit the iceberg, and all the money, and 2,000 people, and 1,500 people died that day, the captain, going to the iceberg, said, even God couldn't sink this ship. You shouldn't say that to God. God's like, really? And it went down in two hours and 40 minutes. 1,500 people died. People brought tons of valuables on the Titanic because they really thought it was indestructible. So no one bought insurance on all the money they had, and they lost everything. It, it just gives you a good picture about what human beings like to bet their life on. You know, we listen to all the smart engineers, all the smart people that say, hey, this is safe. The Titanic is the safest ship in the whole world. It's the safest place in the whole world. And then just like a couple of days later, bam, 
everyone died. And you know what's ironic about that Titanic is that it says unsinkable. Un un it goes down, and guess why so many people died? They didn't put enough rafts in the Titanic because they thought, hey, what's the use of these things? It's not like we're going to die. I mean, and I think um, New York, we, we have another Titanic, right? Let's go down here. The New York Times article put this out. And uh, for those of you that understand the market a little bit, there's Merrill Lynch. And uh, there's John Thane selling uh, whatever he can save to, you know, Bank of America. And there's, uh, of course, Lehman right here. You can't see the car. Uh, crashed, going bankrupt. And you know, the first time in a long time, since the Great Depression, 1929, we never had such fear in the market ever before. You know, people go, boom, you know, for all the way since 2001, after the tech bust, people started saying, booyah, making tons of money. Everybody wanted to work for hedge funds. Everybody wanted, I mean, if you work for Goldman, Lehman, Bear Stearns, rest in peace. And, you know, and, <laughs> and these guys are the smartest people on the planet. You go, well, why should, it? you know, these guys are, it's just stupid. The Titanic were stupid. They were just, you know, too arrogant. No, what about, what about the smartest people in Wall Street? What about the street? They bet all their money, the Harvard guys, the Princeton guys, some Stearns guys. They bet all their money on mortgages that people couldn't afford to buy. You can't buy a million dollar house if you have a hundred thousand dollar salary. But no, the greed of all the people put more money on housing. And what happens? Everybody loses everything. All the people said for the last five years, it's safe. It's safe to put all your money in, in, in mortgages. I mean, come on, the house, it's the American dream. I bought my house three years ago. Man, I wish I bought it now. It's unsinkable. I mean, what does this show you? What, what does it tell us? It shows us that human beings bet and they have full confidence. They think they're smart. We think we're smart. Tell someone you think you're smart, don't you? Tell them. No, no. I mean, like, hit them and go, you think you're smart, don't you? Let me just tell you what the Bible says. First Corinthians says, it says that the wisdom of humanity will come to nothing. And right now, no one is going to pick elephant. There's nothing pink about the situation. No one is going to party. No one is doing this. And no one is even getting up in the morning because they don't have a job. Why? Because they bet on something everybody thought it was so safe. And you know what's ironic about it? What's ironic about it is the new tax bill, Henry Paulson, Bernanke, President Bush, all the smart people, maybe except the third one. And, um, all the smart people got together, and what they decided to do was, okay, there's no way we could survive. Goldman Sachs was at $70, $86 a share Thursday, almost about to collapse, go bankrupt. They're about to sell. Maryland sold. You know, Morgan Stanley was trying to sell. It was so much fear. What does it tell us about humanity? Well, what is it? You guys are getting this, right? Now tell someone next to you, it means you're stupid, dude. It's like, I don't want, I don't want to talk about how I'm dumb, all right? Well, it's, the irony of the, 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 it's ironic because now what's going to happen is these guys got together and now they have a $700 tax bill. Guess who's going to pay for all the smart people's mistakes? Not you. I'm most of your students. You make no money. You know who's going to pay the bill? It's ironic. It's the 16-year-old in McDonald's flipping. I mean, I think it's one billion served now. So, I mean, these guys flipping burgers, their taxes are going to pay for that 1% elite. People that scoff at McDonald's. They're the ones 
that are going to pay for this stupid bet that everybody thought was so safe. I love it when God takes the foolish things of the world and shames the wise. And the question it really brings to us is this. What are you betting your life on? Because we obviously know that stock prices is inflated. Obviously, we know security is just an illusion. Financial security is an illusion. Now, you graduate from NYU, Columbia, um, you might get a job. Before, it was like, yo, NYU Stern, let me get a job. Goldman, you want me? Now, it's just like, please take me. I have $200,000 in loans. My ass is broke. And if you don't take me, I'm going to default on my loans and my credit's going to get messed up. So, I mean, now you can't go to Pink Elephant because there's nothing pink about the situation. I mean, now it's bleak. Job market's bleak because there's no jobs. 50,000 people are unemployed. So what are you betting your life on? I mean, really, everybody's all happy and great when the economy's doing really well. But when it bottoms out, people get really scared. And it just shows us the, re the realistic reality of what security really is. It's just an illusion. Outside of God, there is no security. Amen? Amen. And I want to talk about that. What you're betting your life on. Because you know what? In John chapter 4, this woman was betting her life on what she had. And you read, you, you saw when we read she says that she had a water jar. This is a, a, a ghetto sample bar I just uh, drank in the morning. And it looked like this. And I wanted to say, you go, Pastor Sam, the, the water jar is way bigger than that. I know. Hyperbole, OK? It's an exaggeration. Follow me, OK? So go to the passage and watch this. Woo. I did that. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then it says that then. Leaving her water jar, right? Then leaving her water jar, but when whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. This is coming up. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him what a. Now we talked about this women in the well the last three weeks, and you're like, can you really pull something more out of this passage? Yes. I can pull more out of it for the next 10 weeks, but I'll spare you the pain. One more time next week, and we're done. But the water jar, if you really think about it, if you're smart and you thought about it, represents her economical perspective, her social economics. And you're like, what the hell does that mean? Well, if you took economics, economics basically comes from the perspective of scarcity. What does it mean to be scarce of something? Not having enough, right? Economics, basic law of economics is that it goes, it's supply and demand, right? There's more what? Demand. If there's more supply, the demand's what? Right. So the cost is determined by that. So her economics of her life, the water jar represents how much she would be willing to settle for. Because remember, she has this water jar, and what she's saying is, at least I have this. At least I have something. And the passage says, and why we're talking about her is because what? What, what did her action is then what? <coughs> Read that with me. Then? Just a word leaving. That's good. Leaving. And the question she was asking Jesus and, and the offer Jesus was giving to her was, I have a better life for you. I have more for you. And then she had a very difficult time letting go of what she had because maybe if she let it go, risked it, she wouldn't even have this. But there was, she was there at, at that conflict. Now, it represented her mentality of scarcity because she was living with a man that was, she wasn't married to. She chose this life. But she said, at least I have something. Now, I know many of you, if you drive, 
How many people ever buy, like you go to McDonald's or Burger King, and you buy the fountain drinks? You guys know what I'm talking about? The fountain drinks, and you, there's a, you know, if you have a car, you put it on your car, the, the you know, what do you call those things? Little thingies? Cup holders? Yeah, cup holders, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I know economics, but I don't know what that's called. So, so I put it down there a couple of days ago, and it's, you know, it is like uh, Diet Coke. And I know you guys don't lie, okay, you guys all do this. You're too lazy to take that thing out, fountain drinks, and you leave it there. So the next day you come in, and you see the fountain drink there, right? You see the fountain drink there, and you know you shouldn't drink it, because it's going to be what? Flat, nasty, bugs could have went in there. I mean, it could be disgusting. But we are intrigued by the availability <laughs> of this fountain soda. And you know, you're in the car, so you have a choice. Either you ignore this availability, or you choose to uh, pick the fountain drink and you know it's going to taste bad, but you taste it anyway. So I take the fountain drink and I, oh. And then after that one time, I say, like, oh, well, what, I taste bad anyway. I said, drink it up. <laughs> I mean, the other time I uh, had iced coffee. And I forgot I put milk in there. So what I did, what I decided to do was, my brain told me, do not drink that iced coffee. But the, the Dunkin' Donuts cup looked so attractive. So I decided to taste it. And I decided that rotten milk doesn't taste that bad. I'm kidding, I spit it out, I didn't drink the rest, maybe I did, who knows. But that's a good picture. Oh, what C.S. Lewis talks about, how we are, we, it's not that we're, we have high taste, we are too easily satisfied. We are too easily satisfied. Our economics is the same as the world market. We don't think there's enough. It's not just about money. It's just not about how much money I have. It's also about my husband. It's also about my wife. It's also about my future. It's about the things I can have in my life. And our perspective comes from a limited view of scarcity. And her mind was scarce. There isn't enough. And that's why we're, we're fighting for the same man or the same women, Dawson's Creek Syndrome. I mean, right? You go to NYU, I bet you there's tons of Dawson's Creek going on. And, you know, you, you go here, there, there's these, we just take things just like that fountain soda. You know it's stupid to take it, but you take it because it's available. And you know what? A lot of people in, in their fears are going to take jobs they don't want to do. Because they're afraid that they can't get any more than that. Some people, and you know what? Most people are going to date people they don't want to date. I read a book one time at Best Buy. It was like a pink cover book. And I was like, interesting. I'm very intrigued by pink. See? I got the pink cover book and it said, it was a dating book, but a man wrote for a woman. And I was like, cool, PhD. I turned to the first page, and the title of the first chapter was, You Don't Like Him That Much Anyway. You don't like him that much anyway. I read the first page, and it said, leave him. I was like, yeah. Leave him because you don't like him that much anyway. You're waiting for the right guy to come along with because you don't have the right guy, you're staying with him. And this question of cheap economics, for us, we're willing to take almost anything because we have this scarce mentality. The world right now, the economy is breaking down because there's not enough money to go around. For you, you need to embrace the economy of Jesus Christ. Amen? You're like, what is the economy of Jesus Christ? The economy of Jesus Christ is Ephesians 1. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms, heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Say blessing. blessing. Now, God's economy comes 
not from Wharton's professors. They say that all economy is run in the system of scarcity. God's economy comes from the place of abundance. I don't know about you, but I want blessing. How many people want blessing? But I don't go after money. Don't you see all the people running after money? They're broke. They have no job. Everybody that was smart bet on subprime mortgages and got killed for it. And now they need Uncle Sam, people flipping burgers to bail them out. So next time they go get a McDonald's burger, they should say, thank you, boss. They bailed them out. Look at that. Look at the foolishness of what we put our trust on. We think we're in control. We're the captain of our ship. Let me tell you something. I run toward Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 says, in who? In who? Christ. Christ is your blessing. That's who you need to run to. This is what Jesus was saying, wasn't it? Look. But whoever drinks this water, right, will thirst again. But indeed, the water I give him will become, what? In him a spring of? No, not water. Living water. Living water. Meaning, it's a place of abundance. So, let me ask you a question, okay? How big, how large is your life at the moment? Are you settling for things that's just available? I mean, I know I'm talking to some guys and girls. Are you just taking things that are available because you don't believe there isn't enough to go around? Or will you run to Christ and believe in abundance? Because, you know, you know why I'm a pastor, right? Some people think I'm a traitor, but I'm not. I'm a pastor because I want to work for the richest person on the earth. Forget Goldman. The Bible says God owns the earth. I work for the wealthiest being, not human being, but being on the universe. He has a place of abundance for me. And you see, I follow that. And you know what? You see this water jar? You know what she was saying to Jesus the whole passage? Why would I be crazy enough to give you full control? When I have this, what will I get in return? But when she put the water jar down, her puny, tiny version of a life, she put it down. She found something so much greater in return. Don't you want that? How many people want the best God has for you? I'm not just talking about, I mean, yeah, honey, I know you want a husband. Hot and holy. Don't settle for just holy. <laughs> I, I'm in the business of mentoring hot, holy men. Sometimes. <laughs> Don't settle for a job you think it's just based on your educational criteria. No, you need to bank, and the safest place that you can live in is in Christ. He has the world economy in his hands. Or unless you're, then your identity, if you bank on yourself, you bank on your own gifting, then you're just gonna be like the stock market. Your identity is gonna be, oh, one second, I'm the man, I'm winning, and then when it goes down, I'm a loser. Up and down, up and down. Your identity will be based on the market. But when you base your life on Christ, you're just always the man, like me. You just always look good. I'm kidding. Half kidding. You, you see what I'm saying? So you need to bank your life on Christ and live in his economy. Because let me tell you, God promises living water. Not this stale, dry availability because it's just available, we take it. So what are the things in your life right now you're just taking because it's available? How cheap are you? I want expensive taste. And that's what God's calling us to do. So the, the question is really, the question here is how do we give God full control? Well, obviously, you have to leave the water jar. And even though it might, you, it might seem crazy to you because that's something you have. At least you have that. 
You need to leave the large R. You need to let it go. So the first lesson we learned here is this. Uh, why would I be crazy enough to give God full control? Well, first lesson we learned is because it would be, be crazy to settle for any less. You would be crazy to settle for things that are just available when God has so much more in Christ. I think I'm preaching to someone, right? Mm -hmm. We need the Asian response. Yeah. Bob. <laughs> yeah, we want the best. But you see, sometimes when you control your own life, you're the captain of your own ship, what happens is you not only live from a mentality of scarcity, there isn't enough, I'm scared, what if I don't have enough? You keep thinking about that, what about my future, what about my job, what about my spouse, what about this, what about that? But when you control those areas of your life, you also control how you live your life morally, not just economically, but morally, right? And this is what Jesus addresses next. And she says, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the, and said to the people, come see a man who had told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Remember, her sole goal of going to the well was what? Isolation. Say isolation. isolation. You see this woman full of shame, full of sin, full of rebellion, and now she goes back to where? The town. And she starts talking to people. She goes from isolation to community. And you got to catch this, okay? Everybody, put your thinking caps on. The jar. Snap a bottle here. Here, YouTube. See that? It's a dollar fifty. Inflation. Price. Price inflation. I remember when this was a dollar. But anyway, I'm getting back. So, the jar not only represents her perspective of the mentality of scarcity, but it also represents her view of morality. Because when she was leaving the water jar, she was also leaving a life of what? Sin. And she went to the, you know, the well because she was ashamed of her sin, the sexual sin, the shame brought upon her family, all the bad things that she was doing. And you know what? I'm tired of the church acting like everybody is supposed to be nice. Like everybody reads their Bible 6.30 in the morning. They wake up. People can't even come to service at 10 o'clock. I mean, you know, we have this perspective of Christians being this nice, Flander-like people. I don't know about you, but I identify more with the Simpsons than the Flanders. Amen? I wouldn't even want to be the Flanders. God, shoot me. I identify more with the Simpsons. I am like every Simpson. I don't like playing heal the leper, okay? So, you guys didn't get that. It's okay. But, you see, I'm, I'm more like the Simpsons. I'm more broken. I'm, I want to be real with my brokenness. I want to be real about how I'm not perfect how I struggle internally. I struggle with things that no one knows about. And you know what? The church is full of people like this, but no one knows about it because we all come to church like this. Sit down. Just because you lift your hands doesn't mean you're holy. You got to think all the people lifting hands, they're probably more, you know. <laughs> so they come and they worship a little harder. Be like, Jesus, I know I did this last night, but I'm trying to pay it off right now. <laughs> I'm trying to pay it off right now. I'm trying, and you know, and no one wants to, it's, it's kind of like the elephant in the room, but no one wants to address the elephant. Everybody knows everybody's a hypocrite, but they don't want to talk about it. Why? Because it's uncomfortable. Last week we said that uncom you need to be, uh, be in a place of discomfort to change. Her, she chose a life that's more for her, and she let go of her sin, and she went forward and went to a place of community. A lot of us, a lot of people really don't know us, do they? 
We conceal the things that we do in our life. I never really let people in. Let me tell you the state of the church in Manhattan. Let me tell you what it looks like after you graduate and you go into the world of finance and economy and hedge funds. Let me tell you what it looks like. I have so many people, acquaintances and friends that I know. And one time, a hedge fund, the guy that works at a hedge fund came to me and said, Pastor Sam, I don't know what to do. And I said, what's your problem, man? And he said, I can't tell you. Don't you hate people like that? Pastor Sam, I, I don't know what to do. I can't tell you? I said, why the hell are you bringing it up? And then after 30 minutes, uh, all right, well, I don't know you know because you're a pastor, but, and I said, I know you're effed up, man. That's like my favorite word at church. He goes, all right. He says, you know, I, I go on business a lot to Taiwan, Hong Kong, Asian countries. And in Asian countries, and in my world, in the financial district, in, in that part of the world, in the businesses that we do with those people, prostitution is socially acceptable. And he says, I'm not talking for me, of course. And I says, of course. You're talking about your friend, right? He's like, yeah, how'd you know? Yeah, I, I could read. I could read minds. You know? And, and he says, uh, yeah, you know, and, um, you know, and I have a lot of friends coming to me telling me their struggles about this issue. I'm like, sure. Sure. And he says, yeah, but you see, it, it's really hard because um, a, a, a lot of us are married. We're making a lot of money. And a lot of us are believers. But no one knows us when we go on these business trips to Asia. And a lot of us who are not believers talk about this like it's just candy. It's acceptable and you're even weird if you don't participate in this type of thing. And he said, I don't know, you know what's going to happen. There are men, people that we want to be, and women that want to marry those men. They're believers, but no one wants to address that this man, these men, the most successful men in Wall Street, cheat on their wives repeatedly for the last 30 years. And you know what the most tragic part about this is, guys? Am I talking to somebody? You're like, no, not me. <laughs> the most tragic thing about this is that the wives know what their husbands are doing. But they accept it. Because they need to be married to a winner and the winning credit card. And their life, the way they live their life, so, when you control the way you live your life and you don't give total surrender to Christ, you don't turn to Christ, you also control your own morality. Even though you know your conscience and the Bible and the people around you say it's wrong, no, but you keep going back to the places that will destroy your life, your kid's life, and your marriage. Because no one is asking you the hard questions like Jesus. How many people think this conversation is very uncomfortable? Amen? Good, I did my job. I want it to be very, but I want you to wake up to this, this, this you know, cloud nine reality about the church. No, the church isn't a struggle for morality. And it's not just about morality. It's really about how much we're settling for. Why is settling, well, I'm married to this guy. Well, he's just a guy. And a lot of girls say this, well, he's just a guy. That's what guys do. I don't know, honey. But just remember, the father is your father-in-law, and he doesn't want that. We should not settle for any less than God has called us to be, amen? And you see, 
when she was letting go of her sin, down, she was giving God full control. Saying, God, I give you full control of my life. I believe that 180 Manhattan is just four weeks. It's fine. We thought that when we came in the first week, oh, we're going to have 300 people walk in. We'll have near 300 people here. But it's okay. God called us here. Why? Because this diplomatic version of Christianity is gone, baby. We're going to preach the conviction truth of God in Manhattan. Because my friends, and I know a bunch of them that they need this. They need the hard questions. You need the hard questions. Begin to love the hard questions because the hard questions eventually make you forget about the tears and the lifting of hands and going to church and out of church. When you change is when you let go of the scarcity mentality and you let go of your sin. Amen? You're like, well, that's hard, man. Can I just feel relief? No. That's the 180 life. Letting it go. And the question I have for you is, who do you want to be? Five to 10 years down the line. I told myself when I was 21, I don't want to be a 40 year old man looking at a 21 year old girl in the streets of Manhattan. I want to have a pop belly while I already have that. And, you know, I want to walk around my son and my hot wife and be in love with her and love my son and become a man that can represent the father. Amen? I want to be that. I don't want to be that. But let me just tell you, all the guys with suits are the ones that give the prostitution the most money. We know Spitzer and everybody else in Wall Street. Do you think Spitzer just got caught for no reason? No. All the people that were mad at him set him up, okay? He was messing with the wrong people. All those people do the same thing. That's not who you want to be. So the question Jesus is asking me today is, do you believe I have streams of living water for you? I believe it. Do you believe it? So second, how, how would you be crazy enough today to give God full control of your life? Why should you? Well, secondly, when you give your full control to God, you're going to have real friends. Read that for me. Not just crazy friends, because we have plenty of those. <laughs> but crazy, awesome friends. Friends that I met in my life that are in the trenches with me of wanting to become the best man and best woman I can be in Christ, not settling for any less than who he called me to be. I want to be a man that my son can look up to. Don't you want to be a woman that other people can look up to? I mean, really, the truth of the matter is your choice of control. Turn it over like the woman did. Learn from her. I, I, was gonna, I should bring everybody a Snapple bottle. Leave it here. Because it's not worth it. So, question. You're going to hear from me every week, but who are the people in your life that can ask you the hard questions? Who are the, I pray that the Holy Spirit would show you the faces of the people that can beat the living crap out of you. Take you to the mattresses. Take you to the place in your life that you don't want to go. I mean, who are the people? You don't have them, then you're not going to change. And I want to invite you to an invitation to go with us to really embrace change. Amen? Even though it's hard. Now, watch this. I'm going to invite Eddie and Henry up, so come up. We're gonna interview real quick as we end today, one of your own people, NYU person. Let's go, come up. So, uh, Eddie, you could come up first, and Henry, you could come up next, okay? Let's give Eddie a hand, guys. Here we go.
There's a mic for you. Okay. Oh, well, that, that mic. Oh, that mic, that mic, sorry. Come to this mic, okay. Now, so one year ago, you were this money hungry. <laughs> Last week, we were going back to Staten Island site, and Eddie said, yeah, this is where I used to get my fake IDs, man. And I was like, man, boy, you came a wrong way. So what does this jar, this water jar, represent for you? Just tell them the story. The way, the way you changed, I don't know. Just remember, like, another hundred people are going to watch you on YouTube, right? So you want to be suave, and all, this, all the you know, things they t taught you in Stearns impress people. All right, let me start over. <laughs> um, so, I think it was about a year ago, um, when recruiting, it's like recruiting season. So, I mean, I heard it sucks now at Stern just because they don't even come. But yeah, it was recruiting season and I was a senior, so I was looking for a job because, you know, you go to Stern to get a job, you know? And- um, Did you do any of this too? Maybe a little. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, and I, and I was just feeling down because I really didn't want to go to these interviews. And, but I mean, I needed to get a job. So um, I've been hearing stories from people who graduate and stuff, and they talk about like the crazy hours and a lot of work, but you still get a lot of money. So I was like, oh, I'll be down with that. I'll, I'll just suffer for a couple of years. Um, but I, at the same time, like I was also coming late to church and stuff because um, I was just feel I was just not feeling it. And I remember like just sitting in my room one day and I was like, damn, I feel kind of guilty about not coming to church. And that exact moment, Pastor Sam IMs me. I have the uh, prophetic I am hands. I'm like, he's like, yo, Eddie, we need to talk. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, <laughs> what are we going to talk about? <laughs> and, um, you know, basically we had this whole talk and uh, about why I wasn't coming out and like, all this crap I was going through. And, you know, Pastor Sam, he's, just, he's man manipulative. And basically we had this talk and he's like, he just got me to this vulnerable state and he's like, Eddie, isn't it about time to change? And I was like, yeah. And I think by God's grace, you know, I got to see what my life could have been in like 10 years, you know? Like, I could have, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't know this Wall Street thing was going to happen, but, you know, if it was, like, still booming, you know, I could have made, like, a hundred grand, you know, working 20 hours a day, you know, being miserable. But I decided maybe, you know, Pastor Sam was right, maybe Christ has better, and I kind of do want to wake up every morning wanting to do my job. So, you know, I was like, okay. Let's just have to do it. So <laughs> uh, that Sunday I went and I prayed and I was like, God, I'm just going to give you everything. And I don't know what that looks like, but just take it all. Cause, so it was you know, a risk. It was a risk. Weren't you going to work for Lehman almost? Um, um, I, I wanted to. You're yeah. jobless. You're jobless right now, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what do you think you can let them know, all these guys? There are some of them in business, some of them are in NY, mm -hmm. some of them are whatever. What can you tell them about when you give God full control, what happens? Uh, you stand before people, and I tell you to lead worship, of course, you know that already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when you take risks for Christ, um, it's, it's really adventurous, and it's risk-taking, and like, you don't know where you're going to end up. But you look back like... You know, you go through the stages, you let Christ lead you, and then you look back like a year and you're like, the heck happened? And, you know, your life is so much happier. And you, honestly, people say like, oh, why would I be crazy enough to give Christ full control? Like, you know, I can be making this money, amount of money, you know, and doing this. But like, and people think of giving your life over to Christ as like a bad trade-off, but Honestly, you gain so much more for giving your life to Christ. So that's what I'm in the process of. And, you know, if I think it's a safe bet.
but I'm not the smartest guy, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. I'll just give him a hand. All right, Henry, would you come up? All right, so we did a Stearns guy of his struggle of surrendering to God, and he did, and it paid off. Because God is taking him to places that he never thought he would go to. And, this, and now this is an artist. Okay? He makes abstract look normal. <laughs> so, 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 so tell us about what... Uh, did, did Eddie steal our water jar? No, did I you? <laughs> All right, you can visualize it. So, tell us what the water jar was for you before you uh, surrendered <coughs> control totally to God. Um, well, to explain that, I'd have to ex introduce them to my parents. Go ahead. Uh, well, my parents were, you know, loving. I grew, I was grow, I was raised in a, a really loving family, but they they sacrificed everything to come to America. You guys all know that story, the immigration story. So. Uh, my whole life, they've been my greatest influence. At the same time, they they were kind of like my greatest fear. Um, because of that, you know, because of my path towards art, you know, they had to kind of bite their tongues, and I kind of accept that. And they really had to just, you know, elbow me to like, okay, you gotta make a career out of this. How is it gonna happen? So as I would go from high school to college, you know, the paths would get harder and harder because, you know, making making money as an artist is you're gonna have to compromise a lot of things. And at the same time, knowing, knowing that I had those influences, I was still also trying, you know, trying to seek God. I was, at, you know, I was going through Christian fellowships and stuff. Um, but um, I was definitely living in mixture. I mean, I think, I think uh, you never know, you know, you really see the ugliest sides when you're facing the crisis and the crossroads of your lives, what you have to sacrifice and knowing what you can do and knowing what you have to let go. And that's definitely one of my things. And for me, as an artist, it was my ambition. You know, it was to make it, you know, to be famous. <laughs> uh, but my ambition was definitely fueled subtly by my parents', uh, my parents uh, expectations and trying to live up to that, you know, incredible reputation of what they sacrificed. But uh, yeah, that was my in most incredible fear, yeah, especially as an artist. Was, yeah. So tell us about that event we had in our room when you turned everything over to Christ. <laughs> the most famous line and everything. Let's talk about that. <laughs> well, it was, um, it was really ugly. And, uh, yeah, I really didn't even know if that was really me speaking that night. And that was only the first stage because Oxfest came. That was a whole new level. <laughs> but, uh, but I remember when, uh, when I, I remember I was cursing out Pastor Sam. I was cursing out Amin. He was swinging. <laughs> I was about was, to knock him out. It was bad. But then if I knocked him out, how could I save him, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I really couldn't see the reality of Jesus Christ. Like, I really couldn't see that. And um, I think that's, those are the things that we as Christians are going to have to face through. You know, those times when you don't see anything, when you don't see anything work. And, um, yeah, I remember I was, leaving, <laughs> I was leaving the room, and I probably left, I think, three times in and out. And... Um, yeah, I remember I was just, I was going to start the car and I was about to head home, but I was like, oh man, I'm going to have to face these guys again tomorrow and it's going to look stupid. So I just, you know, I just sighed and then I just walked right back in and I was like, oh, let's, let's do this censored version. But, <laughs> yeah. And then um, I remember Henry getting on the floor and you know, people tell you that they believe in Jesus and stuff like that. Uh, I believe sort of, let me tell you, when you surrender your full control to Christ, you're going to remember it. You're gonna have, you're gonna, it's gonna be like a white flag. All right, he, and he said, he, cr he was crying and he said, effing Christ, I surrender my effing life to you. I don't know what the hell that means at all, but I would do it. And you know what, let me just tell you something. As a result of Henry surrendering his life to Christ, people are coming to Christ through his films. He gave up. Film school, and the world say, that's stupid, that's foolish. But now we're starting a company that's actually making money. Booyah! <laughs> making money not for the individual person, making money so things like Manhattan and effed up people like you and the other people around Manhattan can be confronted with the message of Jesus Christ. This guy surrendered his life to Christ totally. And what do you get now? You don't even care about art. 
Not, not really. You know, <laughs> I'm you know, just a fake artist. <laughs> really. You know, Henry comes to me and says, Pastor Sam, I don't need to do this. I don't need to do this media thing. You know, I just want to love Jesus. And I said, uh, we kind of need you to do it, you know? <laughs> you know. But he's like, I don't even need to do it. Now, I just want and tell us a little about what you're experiencing, the joy or the thing you're getting from surrendering, giving your whole life to God, seeing everything happen and things like that. Tell people your story. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, you guys need to hear this. Um, <laughs> but I think following, you know, like just being real with Christ, I think for me, it was a tremendous amount of freedom to be able to go through that my greatest fear, really. And um, some of the greatest rewards, which I've never even imagined were, you know, hooking up with 180 Films. We didn't know that was gonna happen. I really had very little faith. It was ANC at that time, I had no faith. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's one. I think we got to meet the national director of the Christian Missionary Alliance, work with him. And, you know, who knows what'll spring up from there. Um, for me, I think, I, you know, a great, a great and incredible testimony came out, you know. Uh, how you're free? Tell people how you're free. Yeah, I mean, before I was ashamed of the gospel in my own house. You know, I, I couldn't say the word Jesus to my, my own, to my own parents. And I didn't even know why until I had to go through that crisis. I had to see the ugly stuff that had to come out. But now it's like, my parents are like, okay, so you're gonna go to the office? You're gonna go work on yourself? I'm like, yeah, I'm going, thank you. So, I mean, th I mean that's the only way they're gonna, that's the only way they're gonna show their support for me. I mean, because they don't understand it, but. Um, yeah, the tremendous amount of freedom, and I'm able to lock on to that and hold on to that, yeah, dearly. Let's give him a hand. Okay. Okay. I remember a, a, a scary statement Henry made was, Pastor Sam, I told my parents, I'll be homeless for Jesus. If you can't support it, I'll be homeless. And then uh, Henry said, oh, Pastor Sam, if I get homeless, uh, can I, like, live with you? <laughs> and I said... Let me think about that one. No, no, no. I said, we, you, you'll go eat where I eat. I go eat at buffets most of the time, and I'll feed you. But, but, but the thing was, it was such a drastic change of experiencing that crisis moment. You see, there has to be that crisis moment. There was a crisis moment for her, wasn't there? Don't think you can just breeze by Jesus. And you know what? Just like I did to Eddie, I'll hound you down on Facebook. Uh, no, but the whole point really is there has to be a crisis moment where you totally surrender your life to God. It just won't happen because you hear good sermons or boring ones like this one. I mean, you, you know, I mean, it's not going to, it's not going to be, it's going to have to be a time where you come to a moment and you say, I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to bet on you, Father. And that's the question God's asking you. What are you going to bet on? You saw the stupidity of Wall Street. All the smart people. What do you want to bet on? That's the question God's asking us. Let's all stand and pray together.